um, you coming out and giving me the opportunity to try to help you. Uh, my name is Dr. Peter Ely, and um, a, I am a math professor. More specifically, I am a math educator. I've taught middle school. Yes, I've been in this setting for a while. I've taught high school, and now I'm on the collegiate level doing the same thing. So what I want to try to do here today is I'm going to debunk some things for you, um, some myths that are out there. I'm going to talk about those, and then I have an activity because this is a workshop, and I believe when you have a workshop, that means activity. I'm getting feedback here. Where am I being built? A workshop means that you're actually going to work, right? Workshop. So I do have one activity I do want to demonstrate to you all that we will do, that I ask that you do with your child um, during this time period. And then I'll go forth and show you some of the other things that are out there. Because we live in a very fascinating time in that we have a lot of things and a lot of resources out there that are actually out there for free. But being able to access them and not be, a, be afraid of them is usually a problem. So anytime you have a question or anything, just throw your hand up and just stop me. And I'll be more than glad to stop and help you on this issue. All right, so I'm going to talk about a little bit what we're going to cover. Actually, we're going to talk about what MAP is. A lot of people think they know what math is, but we'll talk about that. Uh, conceptual understanding versus memorization. We'll also talk about what is math literacy. You've probably heard this term before. You start to hear some new buzzwords that a lot of people use in math literacy. We'll talk about opposing problems. Emphasis on the process. Then we actually go to the gun, the, um, the gun drop problem or the activity. And then we're going to end with some social media and how it can actually help you. Alright, so what math is not? I think it's better to talk about math in terms of what it's not. And a lot of people think, number one, it's about computation. What do I mean by computation? Meaning that I added 2 plus 2 and I got 4. Or that I multiplied and I got this. It's also not memorization. Most of you, when you learn your multiplication um, facts, what did you do? Well, if you were like me, I'm not dead old, but we wrote them down like a hundred times. And then we had flashcards, and then I remember they used to have this thing where you used to press the button, you remember that? Uh, my parents, y'all probably remember that when you could press the button, and it was kind of like a clear plastic, and when you held it down, you could actually see the number under it. Y'all remember that? That was before we got techie, right? That was um, low tech. You actually press it, and you know it was clear, right? And a lot of us learn things like that, right? Um, but today they have a lot more um, going forward, so we're going to talk about why it's not a memorization of facts and skills, because if you memorize things, sometimes you can do what we call forget. And a lot of times I call this garbage can memory. Meaning that, you know, you got it today and you throw it in the trash and it's gone tomorrow. And then we wonder why we, we, we struggle a little bit. Also, math is really not hard to do. It's not. And, I, and I'm going to prove that to you because math is more a tool to to go to, to discover the, the, the import of this situation that we're going to get into. And you're going to find that out. That everything that we learn are just tools for us to advance forward. Alright, so conceptual understanding versus memorization. So when I actually conceptually understand something, I don't remember it. I actually know how to derive it from anything. So what we shoot for in mathematics is conceptual understanding because if you have a conceptual understanding of a situation, then you're able to derive it from many other situations. Let me give you an example. I don't know about you all, even though I'm a math professor, I have a tendency sometimes to forget multiplication problems because I've memorized them. Right? So I welcome you, what's 9 times 8? Oh. The kids know right top of the head because they memorize them. They're using them all the time. However, if I forget what 9 times 8 is, I know how to find it. It may take me longer to get it than you. But it doesn't mean I don't know how to get it. Because 9 times 8 is just saying do what? Add 8 9 times. Right? Or it's saying add what? 9 8 times. So do I really need to know how to multiply? No, but I do need to know how to do what? Add. But when they get to a time test, they don't get to the time test. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk. We're going to get there. Okay? <laughs> Because if, you, if, if you're finding out, we're getting away from that model because they understand and they finally get it and they work. Because mathematics is not about speed. It's never been about speed. But we've made it this thing about speed 
in our schools. Give you an example. When somebody says somebody is good in math, what do they usually mean? Well, yeah, they can count good, but we're usually referring to, if I tell a student, normally, when I was a teacher before I came on this side, when I said a student was good at math, number one, it was because they had accuracy, and they usually had speed. If you memorize multiplication facts, don't make you good at math, it's just that you memorize them, and you know them. English majors memorize a lot of words. So it's the same type of skill. What is that building? Nothing but memorization. You see what I'm getting at. So what, I mean, what was the math skill there? There was nothing. You just memorized it. So when you see something that looks like this, then you automatically what? Remember what it was. Now what if I change it a little bit? That's when our kids start having problems, right? They get them x plus 2 equal to 7, and if they put 2 in front of it and put the x in the back, it's a whole different problem for them. Why? Because they memorize x plus 2 equal to 7. And when I see it and it looks like that, I do what? I do what my teacher said. This step, this step, this step, and this step. And my problem is, if I don't rememberize all the steps, then I'm pretty much, well, I'm in the class, I can't say what I want to say. I'm pretty much in trouble, right? Are, are we, are, is it starting to hit home a little bit? So now we're talking about more about what? Them memorizing versus a conceptual understanding. Because if my students have a conceptual understanding of what they're doing, it doesn't matter if they change the problem this way or that way. They understand concepts that say that when things have this form, this is how we solve. So we're going for conceptual understanding versus just memorization. Meaning that if I have a, a single variable in a problem, x plus something, I know it's equal to something. And then since it's equal, then I know I have to use the fact that they're equal. So whatever I do to one side, I have to do to the other side, right? Not because my teacher said that was a step to do, but actually because of equality. Because that's what it means to be equal. Think about it in terms of a scale. You take something off this scale to make it equal out, what do you have to do? Do whatever you did to the other side to make it equal back out, right? That's all equal, equality says. So if your problem is going to be true, then you have to continue to do the same thing to both of them. That's a concept. That's not a step. Because if that's a, if you understand it's a concept, what it means to be equal to something, it doesn't matter what kind of problem you I can give you a calculus problem and you at least know the basic steps. Well, whatever I do here, I have to do here even if I don't know how to solve it. Does that make sense? So we're going from a conceptual understanding point of view. And this is very important and you will understand a little bit why as we go further because conceptual understanding helps students build the problem solving process. So mathematics is not about speed, it's not about accuracy, contrary to what we tell them, but it's really about problem solving. That's all it is. It's all problem solving. Now, we, as teachers in the traditional classroom, we do have some standards that we want them to be able to solve some things in a small amount of time. However, it's not about that. It's about can I get through the process and think about the process logically to come to the, the answer. Because remember, that's more than one answer. I mean, well, it's not more than one answer, but it's more than one way to get the right answer. Right? And you know, you, you've been in classes where the teacher, you didn't do it the way I showed you. Well, it's not about did I do it the way you showed me, it's about did I do it correctly. Now, I might have tried to come here like I came here today, try to get here to this school. You know, there's several different ways I could have got to this school. At the end of the day, I got here. Now, it was several ways I could have went that could have took me a lot longer to get here. And that's what we have a tendency to do in schools when we, man, when we are going out for speed and, and accuracy, is that we're trying to show them the shortest way, but sometimes when we do that, we actually cut off creativity. Think about it. You walk around with a cell phone in your pocket. Somebody thought of that. That's creativity. That's what makes America America. We're more creative than anybody else on earth. Think about it. Look at some of the stuff we do. Our creativity and our innovation makes us who we are. This is the basis of this. This is why you see our president and our governor and all these people pushing what they call STEM education, science, technology, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Why? Because this stuff stems creativity. 
You know, there's no wrong way to solve this problem as long as you, it's logical and you follow all the different, as long as, as long as your argument is logical and you follow all the steps going forward. But, in, you know, some people can solve it in two minutes. Some might can solve it in 20 minutes. But you do not discredit the child. And I know sometimes as parents, we get to that point, like they didn't solve it fast enough, we may get down on it. And I'm telling you, don't do that. You might have Einstein on your hands. He's just thinking about it in a different way somebody else never thought about it. And that's a, sometimes it can be a good thing. But from a teacher point of view, we usually don't like it. Why? It makes us work hard. Think about it. If every student in here did the same problem, got it correctly, but they did it a different way, how much more work is that for me? That's a lot, because i got to see, mm, does it really make sense that she did it this way? So I have to follow all the steps and go through it. And it's like, it may be correct, but they went a roundabout way to do it. So a lot of times to answer your question, that was the long answer to your question is, yes, we go with speed and accuracy for that, but we cutting off a lot of stuff, and that paradigm is actually shifting. Because now with the Common Core, the Common Core is saying what? Let's integrate all this stuff together. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. All right, so what is math, math, math literacy? Math literacy is to identify and understand the role that mathematics plays in the world, is to be literate about mathematics and its applications. Remember, mathematics is a tool. It's just one of many tools. You got a chemistry tool, you got a physics tool, you understand where I'm getting at? All this stuff is tools. You just put all this stuff in your tool belt, so when you go to those fix on this boat, you got it. Right? You have to have the tools. You get there, you got a net that's this big, you don't have a tool for it, you're obviously are not working on that boat. So when you come into the school, all you're doing is putting in all these tools in your belt, and at certain times you may need to apply. This means that individuals need to have an understanding of its core concepts, tools of inquiry and methods, and structure. So math is really about problem solving and inquiry based, what I call inquiry based learning. And that you inquire and we come about and we're using math and we learn all these different tools and applications to help us to solve the problem. So we also have from math for, math for teaching.com what is the math literacy three R's? Relevant mathematical concept principles and procedures. Uh, number two, real life context which can be investigated and modeled mathematically and rich mathematical tasks that fossils, conceptual understanding, development of skills and habits of mind. What does all this mean in a nutshell? Give your students or give your child something that's relevant. Something that means something to them. Do you have a kid that wants to sit there on Xbox all day? Well, you need to figure out some of the algorithms that they use to make this game on some of the most basic levels. Or let's look at some of the finance behind, this game cost 70 bucks, why did it cost 70 bucks? Find out where the developers are getting this piece and, that, and this one getting this piece. Find something that interests in your child. Why does LeBron James make all this money? Do I want to be LeBron James or do I want to be the owner of the Miami? You know what sparked your child's interest, you know what it is that they like. They like looking at horses or going to the dog shows. How much do those people make? Can you come up? Which dog is probably the best breed to own and why? These are all problems and things that your kids can do and they come up with creative solutions. And to be honest, sometimes the solution is not exactly probably what we think it should be, but we start the creative process. Because the mathematical process is about students going through the process and really thinking about problems thoroughly. And we call this a lot, a lot of this is called inquiry based learning. So when I say that, then I'm talking about pose problems, pose miniature problems. Problems that actually mean something to your child. This is how you gather their attention. One of the things that I dabble in this too is the hip hop. A lot of people, oh Lord, there he go, that rap and all that. You'll be surprised. You know, your kid will walk around and sing all the lyrics to their favorite song all day long. To that beat, and it's most, most of the time it's more the beat than anything. Well, why can't we use that as a vehicle to actually teach them also? You'd be surprised. There's research that's already out there, and it's a couple of guys that's done a lot of stuff with science, and they actually wrap that whole science book, and the kids know the book from cover to cover because they learn them to the beats. Music is a very powerful tool in any race, creed, color, blue, black, brown, it doesn't matter. 
we all have some kind of rhythmically inclined that we we like music. So why not use the power of that? Find out what your child's interest is and use that as a vehicle to get things done. You have a kid that want to text all the time. I have a friend of mine, he said he was having problems with his kid doing spelling work. Well, what he ended up doing, his kid got, um, kid wouldn't spell the words right. And one day by accident, the kid picks up the cell phone and starts texting him and he thought it was his wife. And from that point, they developed a relationship but his son using text, and, and you know, most of the time if you text and you spell words wrong, that little red line and stuff come on them on the smartphones. And the kids start understanding, his dad was like, well, if you're going to use this, you got to spell all the words right. So by him doing that, he started doing what? Spelling all the words right so he could text his dad back and forth. And because of that, he started doing better in class when it came to spelling. Something that simple. You know they want to use your phone. You know they want to play on it. Why not use that as a vehicle? Sometimes in certain situations. I mean, not all the time. Of course, everything needs balance. But there's a time period where they can use those kind of things. So I wanted to show you this picture here. What do you see significant about this picture? Talk to me. There's two bunnies, uh -huh. and they each have carrots. And one bunny has a big carrot that's on the ground with a little sound. And the other bunny has a small carrot that's on the ground with a big sound. So which bunny would you rather be? We all would easily say that we want to be the bunny with a big carrot. Believe it or not, a lot of times, this is how your child's growth is. You see your child's growth on the left, and you want to see that little bitty stem on the outside, but this is really what's happening under, underneath that. And sometimes we stifle that out before we get to that point because we're looking for what's on the right. Do you understand what I'm saying? Children develop at different rates. Just like right now, I have a baby. I have a daughter. She's 15 years, uh, 15, 16 months, years, 16 months old. Uh -huh. She just started to walk. And people had me panic. I thought something was wrong with my baby, going to the doctor, and, you know, it's my first child, so I didn't know any better. And, you know, it's like every parent, they can develop at different rates. But when I saw everybody who had babies when we had them, their kids been walking since they were seven to eight months old. Of course, what did I do? I'm looking at everybody else's kids, and I see what my kid is doing. My kid. Looks like the little, the little leaf on the top. <laughs> However, I had to stop and pull back and get my eyes off everybody else's kid. Look, but my kid can talk, though. She walks and she, I mean, she's starting to walk and she can talk. She can do all these other kinds of things that I know a lot of the other kids are not doing. And my kid is already about two, almost two feet tall. Oh, wow. The doctor tell me she might be six, too. Mm. So I'm like, okay, yeah, that means her balance is off because she's so long. Can't look at the other side of this, right? It's gonna lay off. She ain't gonna stay this well. And it's the same thing with your child's development. I know you see all these different things that they're going through, and you see this, and all you see is that little stem on the top, because that's what everybody else tells you to look at. That's what they tell you to look at. I'm telling you to look at the bottom one, because this right here, that don't mean nothing. Because after a while, that's gonna be. But you see how he's killing there, like this is a big deal. Like yeah, look what I got. And I'm, and I'm a living witness of that. I went through school. I, I think I was a little bit above average, but I went over the top. I was never about Victoria. I never made straight A's. But I'm the only black out of my school that got a PhD in what we call the hard sciences. I'm the oldest of five. Do you see what I'm saying? That was me on the left. And that's many of your children now. So what I'm telling you is, Encourage and stick with them. Find different ways to engage them, but stick with them because that's them right there. Other thing, emphasis on the process. So remember we was talking about the process. They're not going to get it right all the time. Matter of fact, you don't want them to get it right all the time. But you want some success, but you want a healthy failure. What I mean by healthy failure? Think about it. Uh, those who even in high school, think about it. The classes that you learned the most out of was what? The ones that you really struggled in. Some of the stuff I still remember to this day was classes I got C's out of. The ones I got A out of, well, nothing because it was not a challenge to me. Think about it, even in life, the things that mean the most to you are the things that you did what? You struggled again. 
You know, if you got that brand new BMW sitting on chrome and the whole nine, you remember that because you, you know how long it took you to get that. So you don't let anybody just walk up and do anything to your car. Versus if your daddy grew up and daddy said, what car you want, boy, you just pick it out at the lot. It didn't mean nothing to you. You know, I was more of a Toyota Corolla type guy myself, $150. And it meant everything to me. <laughs> do you see what I'm, I'm getting there? And it's the same thing with him. Mathematics is about patience. And that's why people say it's hard, because we live in a society that we are not patient. We get everything right now. Instant popcorn, instant oatmeal, instant, instant, instant email, instant text messaging. I can't even wait to go home and use the phone before I pull it out my pocket. So everything around us tells us what? Got to happen right now. And when it doesn't happen right now, then we feel like we're, we're failing. What happened to delayed gratification, right? We do remember that. It doesn't happen all the time. How to learn uh, to avoid that pitfall again? One of the things about going through that, you find out, okay, I messed up here, but I know that wasn't the solution because the last time I had a problem that looked like this, it didn't work out that way because of this. And you build upon those things versus if you got lucky the first time you got it, what if the third time down the road when you really needed it? And that, and that pitfall showed up. Making sense to anybody? Now you don't have the tool or the resource for this to get past it. That's how you build uh, accuracy and speed is by through repetition. So math, yes, you do have to do it and do it and do it and do it. It's just like anything else. The more you drive down to the school, you know quicker ways to get here, right? First couple times you come, you're probably going to follow a little road map. I know I did. After that, I'm going to find a little shortcuts to make, right? Or turn down this street because I don't think there be that much traffic at this time. And go out. We do it all the time. They don't even realize it, right? But mathematics and stuff is the same way. After you do it for a while, you start to learn little shortcuts and things that work for you. Right? Let's emphasize the process, but find the fun. The process can be fun. Cats are composed of iron, lithium, and neon. We call them P lines, right? Okay, nobody got my children. P line L E is what? Chemistry for iron. L I is lithium, N E is neon. P line. Okay. I'm going to. <laughs> so find the fun in the process, because there's always something fun in it for them. And that's you know, they all they still can. Find the fun in that process. All right, so we're gonna go to my gun drop, um, um, gun drop problem activity. How many of you actually? This is how you feel sometimes when your kid get a math problem. Yeah. Math problems, call, and then when they give you the call, you gotta figure out a math problem to even get to the call to who to call. That would be funny. So I'm not doing too good as Chris Rock. All right, so what I want to do real quickly, I want to just demonstrate to you a quick activity, or uh, one of many activities you can do at home with your kid. So what I have here is um, gun, gun drops. And I'm going to just give each of you um, parents, a single kid, I'm going to give you a couple each. And then I'm going to come around, I'm going to give you two picks on top of that. Yeah, you can get um, forgive me if I put all the sugar on the table. I'm to get it. Sorry. How many toothpicks per person? Um, they vary. You give them whatever you want to have. You said give them how many? All right. Yeah, they vary. So. You have to do it. Yeah. You don't have to do it. Huh. Don't give them too many. Well, I am. Now, what did you say? Give them however many you want. Yeah, all right. Keep it, try to keep it between five what, what, and... What is too many? See, is it that right. subjective? It is. You are. Okay. It's, try to keep it in between they don't five have to, and one. But they don't have to use all the toothpicks, right? No, but you messed up a problem. <laughs> I should have been more specific. Yeah, amen. That's right. <laughs> Everybody who got some want to participate? Yeah, that's like people. 
Okay, at this point, I think everybody has some gum drops. Now, what we're going to actually do with these gum drops, this is something real simple that you can do at home. Remember, I told you mathematics is more about the process and problem solving. And many times in life, remember, we want real world problems, right? This is what keeps our kids interested. We have limited resources. So, you have some gum drops, you have very, um, Various numbers. Some of you have maybe four or five. Some of you might have two or three. And you have two picks. Now, what I'm going to ask you to do with those two picks is I want you to try to create the best geometric figure you can using everything you got. Using everything you got. So, these two picks, the way this normally works is. I guess I got the round one, so you're going to have to push it a little bit. You just push them right in. Push this right in. Now I got this. I guess I'm cheating a little bit. This. 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 Okay, so I have a triangle. Everybody see? But using the resources you have, come up with the best geometric shape you can come up with. Just the resources you have. You have to use everything. Now, I don't know about you, um, you all, but in Fayetteville, I'm from the country, and we used to have this thing that we used everything from the ruler to the tutor. <laughs> so when you kill all everything got killed, right? You know, the pigtails, snouts, ears, mm -hmm. tongue, nothing got left. So this is that same kind of thing. We don't want you to waste anything. Now, what this causes is a couple of things. Number one, you look at this thing from geometric, a ge geometric point of view. You also try to figure out what's the best way for me to put this together and use all of my resources. Now, oftentimes, some of us have limited resources. So we call that, I uh, think Tupac probably making a dollar out of 15 cents. They still got to pay the rent, right? Uh -huh. Okay. So use this. This is an easy activity you can do at home with your child that, number one, stimulates creativity. Right? Number two, because I'm seeing some creative things already, because number one, what I was thinking as a teacher, I was thinking everything was going to be one dimensional. I'm seeing three dimensional objects already. So then you see how all this stuff can be to teach. So do give your teachers a little bit of slack, but you know, you got to keep them accountable. Because I'm thinking that, oh yeah, everybody's going to make a one dimensional figure. And I probably should have about a two dimensional figure. And I didn't say that, but now I'm seeing 3D, so you already went to my next step. <laughs> nice. Did you use all your pieces? Oh! Look at, look, look. See? Good. Make sure you're using all your resources. Because resources are what? Precious, right? Sometimes this is our time. Sometimes it's our money. Oftentimes it's our money. Sometimes it's just Action. So something this simple, you can learn a whole lot from this. So now, just looking at, I see here, I got a nice three-dimensional object. And my next step is, what is this? It can be a prism. It can be a triangle. We talk about it in two dimension. We can talk. We can talk about the different points here. Does this have? Can you bisect this? It's not bisect, but what, are, what is the measure of the angles? What kind of triangle this is? Well, since we're talking about a three-dimensional object, can we get the surface area of this? Do you see all this stuff that just comes out of this? This is something that they just made up random. We start talking about, since now we talk about three-dimensional, we start talking about volume. What, how much can I pour into this? Right? The volume is a measure of liquid. How much I can pour? Then we want to talk, like I said, the area. Well, what if you want to cut pieces of paper and fit that around this? It's all kinds of simple things that you can do at your home like this with your children. Uh, Amy, we want to put new carpet in your room. We need you to figure out how much carpet we need to buy. Well, Amy can do that. Right? It's got four walls. She knows the area for them. Length times width. Now, don't forget about we can't put it around this piece because we're not going to move this piano or we're not going to do this piece. 
So then she says, what? Now she goes back and she figures out now it's a new problem. So now she has the area of the room. Then she goes and finds the area of the piano around there and then subtract the two. And that's, well, okay, Ma, now I know how much it is. Use them. They want to be used. They want to feel like they're part of the process. Right? Why, why pay somebody else all that extra money? And then, like I said, okay, if they mess it up, you know, that's kind of part of the process. But something you did together. Build a birdhouse. Let them measure the wood. You know, I wouldn't ask them you know, to use the power tools, of course. But let them make the measurements and draw the stuff, and you cut it. And if it comes out flinty, let them know, well, this is what you created. Now, how do we fix this? They learn those things from doing. Math is learned best when you do. Hands-on. That's why I gave you the small hands-on activity, just to show you the different things that can be implemented just out of that. This cost me probably less than a quarter per person to pull up. But this could be hours of fun. Because now we can just keep adding stuff. Or I can take away stuff. Now if I took away some of these pieces, what can you create? If I gave you more, what could you do? Now you see how this is also stimulating what? Creativity. Creativity in mathematics is important. Because we still have problems that we have not solved yet. Because somebody's not come along with enough creativity to figure out how to look at it. That's how things get solved. Super soakers, water guns, all that stuff come out of side products and other stuff. Most of the things we know comes out of side products. You know, how do we know DNA is a double helix? Guys was at the bar having no drink. What if it looked like this? <laughs> well, it did look like that. True story. Microwave. Guy was in the in the uh, in the lab, but doing something else. Man, my chocolate keeps melting in my pocket every day. What in the world's going on? Yeah, from a chocolate bar, we found microwaves. Most stuff is found by accident. How many of you know those super soaker water guns? Guy was a hydraulic scientist for NASA, and he was making hydraulic pumps. And somebody, I can't remember how the story exactly goes, but you end up taking that same technology that they were trying to make for rocket fuel. A rocket scientist and the boys over there playing with water guns in the lab. True story. Super soaker. We all know, you know. I think that was my age. We grew up on those $20. Nobody's going to pay $20 for a water gun. Yeah, right. <laughs> so millions. Right? All this stuff is found out just by side projects. So, yes, let your kid dabble and play and be creative. You don't know what they might discover. Because it's often said one of the problems. With us as scientists, is that we lose when we when you get into a discipline, especially when you go through a, a PhD program or something like that. They teach you how not to be creative. Why? Because it's oh, it's a way that you should look at this. Because all these other people before you looked at it this way, and this is the way that it's accepted in the academy that you look at. It. So what happens? You start focusing on it, and you lose all the other creative um, creativity pieces. Innovation made this country. I promise you. Look, locomotive. Uh, assembly line. All that stuff changed this country through innovation. And mathematics is at the heart of that stuff. One other thing I wanted to um, hit on right before I leave social media. I know some of you are probably tired of seeing this stuff already, right? I don't want them on Facebook. They don't need a Twitter account. What the heck is Tumblr and Pinterest and YouTube? Well, I know what YouTube is. All they want to do is look at them videos. <laughs> There's a lot of different things there. I'm going to let this one play in the background while we're doing this. Now, remember, we were talking about music. And I think it's going to be a Yeah. 
Now this is actually correct. These kids learn probability to create this song.
free resources. I pay nothing for this. Just Google it. Pop right up. Go to your local library. Pull your cell phone out, record the music. I mean, we're resourceful, right? So, that's what I wanted to show you about social media that doesn't have to be a bad thing. Twitter. For parents, I'm not saying kids, Twitter. You walk down on Twitter, there's a ton of things. There are people out there that just spend their whole day just tweeting stuff. A lot of the stuff that I actually learned, I mean, yes, I learned stuff in school, but technology is always what? Turning over every six to eight months. Stuff I'm teaching you now, maybe next year this time, I need to go all over it again. Well, how do I stay up? Because I have to go out there and learn this stuff just like you all do. And be able to come back and teach it. So I'm out there and people who are developing this stuff, they talk about it. And this stuff just be coming up. All the time. Uh, see one of my favorite guys up here. He's always taking so. guy right here, Cliff Mills. He's a technology guru. I don't know him personally, but I do know him personally. Because he sends me a text message every single day. Probably 9 to 10 in a day. He puts links in there. A personal reflections. Change should be a reality, not a possibility. You click on it, it's going to take you to a link or somebody's blog that they already wrote this stuff for that day. Or some kind of new technology or, or what they think about these apps. Are these apps any good before you spend all your money? Because we know when you buy an app just because it got a whole bunch of stars still doesn't mean it's really good. That just made the first 10 minutes I played with it, it seemed to be pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And then after I really tried to get to it and really use it, I found out it was really not that good. But I've already spent my money. You have people like this, they tweet this stuff for free. Just click on it, read, oh, that's interesting. And, and that leads to another thing, and that leads to another thing, and that leads to another thing. One of the other last things I want to show you is uh, Tumblr. Uh, what Tumblr is, is actually a blog, and you can blog pretty much anything, pictures, chat, text. I, had, uh, I encourage you as parents to go ahead and join some of these things. You can put in search, and you can add certain groups that you just want to be a part of. And when they write new stuff, you get the stuff just like everybody else gets at the same time. This one is called the uh, Map Air Prescription, which is by yours truly. That's my blog. So I write the map and prescription. I try to write at least once a week what I think is going on in technology, where we're moving, thoughts, all that kind of stuff, just in the professional realm. So you have professional people out there always writing stuff all the time. All you do is, all this stuff is free. Everything I show you, Tumblr, T-U-M, T-U-M-B-L-R. And you go out there and you just go out there and you can just put in stuff and what you want to follow. You looking for science tips or math tips. I put this kind of stuff on my website. This talk tonight, she's videoing right now. This video will be on my blog. Why? Not only just to help you, but it's other people. I'm only getting to talk to about 50 of y'all tonight, but it's about another 50,000 to a million I can touch next week. And don't even know. Because it's about what? The world is flat. It's about sharing the information. I have probably a bigger international footprint than I do a local. I really do. Last week I was talking in front of 10 Japanese people with an interpreter. I'm going to interpret. And they want to know what we do over here and they're taking it back to China. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because the world really is flat. That's why we have to be globally competitive. So uh, I do have all this stuff at the end. Um, Pinterest, real quick to tell you what Pinterest is. Pinterest is nothing but a cork board, like the cork board you see back here on the sides. You see how they got stuff just stuck on them? You see how they got stuff just stuck on them? Well, it's one that you actually do on the internet. So you make it, it's a free account, and stuff that you like or things you want to hold on to. You know how you find these little websites, you, you try to write them down and you put them on, you got a, a bookmark that's just this long? Well, you can make your digital cork board and just put all the website on there. And just click on it and go back, and then actually, you share it with somebody else. So if you're a parent, I start a court board, parents looking for help for kids in sixth grade math. And what happens? Somebody else sees it, and what happens? Well, can I put this on your board? Because I thought it might work. They start doing the work for you. 
and vice versa. And they say, look, you now you got this big board that's your board, but you share it with everybody else, and people are adding content to your stuff to help you find out more about it because they're interested in the same thing. You're not in this alone. There's strength in numbers. And I'm telling you, use this stuff because it's free. I know some of us are scared of it, but it's free. So, like I said, Facebook is pretty much self explanatory. I showed you Twitter. Tumblr, I showed you that's more of a blog. Pinterest is a, like I said, it's the, um, a, basically a cork board digitally. And of course, YouTube, we know that you put videos up and um, things of that nature. So, as I finish up, again, my name is Dr. Peter Ely. Uh, my contact, uh, you can go to my website, um, www.drpeterhealy.com. Uh, my blog, like I said, is um, the Math Ed pres um, Prescription. And it's at the Math Ed, Math Ed Prescription And then my Twitter is at drpeterhealy.com. Feel free to follow. Um, if you follow the blog, if you, if you follow, add me and follow the blog, every time I write something, you'll automatically get it. And then you can just read it at your leisure or whatever. Or uh, you know, Twitter, the same thing. Uh, and like I said, my website. Uh, my blog is also connected to my website, so if you can't get there, you just want to find out what's going on and map in what's new. Ask questions. I take questions. If you ask a question, I'm having this kind of problem. Can you help? If I don't have the answers, I probably got colleagues who do. So it's nothing for me to pick up the phone. Look, this is Dr. Ely down in Fayetteville. I'm going to call my professor at NC State. He wrote your textbook. What did you mean when y'all said such and such on page such and such? Because I have that kind of access. And I can get that kind of access for you. Oh, we meant such and such, such and such, or we really wanted to take that out and they wouldn't let us take it out of the book, that kind of stuff, and then I can come back and write. Oh, such and such says, such and such, blah, 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 blah. Now there's a blog post. I answered your question, and probably somebody else who had the same question. All right, so that is my time on tonight. I hope that I've been helpful. I hope I won't too preachy, but I hope that I've been helpful to actually help you understand that, number one, get your kids to learn this stuff with conceptual understanding. We don't want memorization. Because if they understand it conceptually, they don't forget it because they understand how to figure it out. They can go back and derive it. Also, don't stifle creativity. Remember my character picture. We don't see what's going on below the surface. Sometimes people just see what's going on on top, and that's what they hoot and holler about. But in the long run, as my daddy would say, he said, the cream rises to the top, just give it some time. In the long run, we'll see what the deal is. All right? Thank you, Arnel uh, Mello. I really appreciate you having me here. I, I count it as an honor to be able to service you, and I hope that I can service you in the future. And I also have my card that I will hand out at the end if you would like. Thank you.